page as he delivers the word. Hey, good morning, everybody. So good to be with you today. Glad you showed up. And if you got a Bible, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9. I want to tell you what we're going to talk about today, everybody. We're hitting the idea of strongholds. So this is going to be a banger. I got a word for you today, and I'm really believing that God's going to do an awesome work in your life. Uh, also, I want to give you kind of a, a bit of a peek behind the curtain as far as where we're going to go the next couple weeks. Next Sunday, I am going to tell you everything that you wish that your pastor would have told you about demons and demonization and we're going to go after it as that's kind of the subsequent text in Mark chapter 9. We're going to hit all sorts of good stuff, guys, in the coming weeks. We're going to talk about the end times and when does Jesus come back? Oh, I got your attention now, right? Because how many of you are just looking at everything and you're like, oh God, come back soon? Show of hands. How many of you? Okay, five of you, the rest of you, I don't know what is wrong with you. The world is in chaos right now. And uh, so we're going to talk about what does that look like? What is that moment in history going to be? Are we close? Are we not close? How can we tell? It's going to be a really good time. So what I want to say to you is make sure that the following weeks are high priority on your list of things to do and bring all of your friends because we are going to see God do an amazing thing. What I want to say about this uh, is this, that we are not trying to attract people. Can I just tell you that? That is nowhere in my list of priorities. We're not trying to attract people. We are trying to free a generation. Amen. Can somebody give me a shout on that? We're not trying to just be, we're not trying to attract. We're trying to see people freed up. And the reality is, is we have these things called strongholds. We've got the unseen realm, demons, all sorts of craziness going on, lies that you and I believe that keep us from the fullness of freedom that Jesus has in store for you. And that's what we're going to talk about. And what I love about Mark chapter nine, we looked at last week with the transfiguration of Jesus is what this text has been called, is this is how you actually get there. This is such a critical text that what we're going to do is we're going to actually jump back. I want to focus on one word uh, that we talked about last week, actually, everybody. This is why it takes us five years to get through a book of the Bible. Uh, so we're going to look at one word. This moment in the life and the ministry of Jesus, it is so uh, much more important than a 40-minute sermon last week. We're going to double back and talk uh, about it. And the big idea last Sunday was this, we're going to piggyback on, is that you, if you are a believer in Jesus, you were created for a fascinated life. How many of you know that's true? And in fact, you don't even have to be a Christian. This is the human condition. You were created to live a fascinated life. Life. You were, and this is why if you look at how we spend our time and the things that we get excited about, so much of you moves in the direction of fantasy and fantasy fiction and novels and film and media because we are hungry for fascination. I remember when uh, the Matrix trilogy came out, uh, and I come from the 1900s, by the way. So for those of you that were born in recent years, I'm from the 1900s. And uh, it was kind of like Matrix came out and it was sort of questionable, like, yeah, you're pretty young. Should you be watching this? So I was like, screw it. We're going to make it happen. And I got a really cool uncle that hooked it up. How many of you got a really cool uncle that hooked it up when you were a kid? All right. So that was me. So I remember seeing the Matrix guys and it was, it messed with my head. Like I came out of that thing. Like, how, am I in the Matrix? Are we in the Matrix? How would you know? Am I Neo? I'm like looking for a white rabbit everywhere that I go, right? And it just captivated me even from a young age. And this is the human condition. And the question is why? Let me tell you why. That is the thumbprint of God on your life. And what happens so often and why there is all the chaos, dysfunction, pain in your life and in the world, it's because you were created for fascination, but we sell out for lesser beauties than the ultimate beauty of just seeing and beholding God. You know what I'm talking about? All right, this is, this is the human condition and why there's so much pain ultimately uh, in life. This is the problem with the human condition. In Mark chapter nine, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. This was not just a moment that something God did that was cool for a couple of his disciples. This is Jesus modeling. You wanna know what it looks like to follow me? You're gonna actually experience what Peter, James, and John did. What did Jesus do? He took up him on a mountain. It says in Mark chapter nine, verse two, and it says that he was transfigured before them. Look at verse three. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white as 
no one on earth could bleach them, right? So Jesus, he becomes otherworldly in this moment. The glory that was concealed in human flesh as he is God incarnate is beginning to break out of his human shell. Peter, James, and John are coming in contact with the glory of God in this moment, and Peter needed to change the pants. Talked about that last week. This is an incredible moment where they are actually seeing and beholding the glory of God. And the problem is you were made for that, but we sell out for things that are far less. I've heard it said once that you are idle in your 20s. You want to know what the idol, the idolatry of your 20s are? It's sex. The idol of your 20s is sex. The idol of your 30s, you know what it is? It's money. And the idol of your 40s is power. And this is the human condition. This is what we tend to do. And Jesus is saying, you're a sellout. You're going for, you're building your life on these things that are not ultimately going to satisfy you. You were created to gaze. You were, I mean, think about it, guys. How, how fascinating does the God who created the category called fascination have to be? How beautiful does the God who created the category called beauty have to be? How radiant does the God who hung the, star, the sun in the sky with a word have to actually be? And what the problem is, is that we disengage from that so quick. What I'm trying to say, the problem in the Western church, you want to know what it is, is you're bored. We're bored. We are bored with a God that we barely know. And I want to ask you a question. Are you living a life that's fascinated by Jesus? You didn't have to tell John, I didn't need to preach to Peter, James, and John this sermon when they are seeing Jesus on the mountain in Mark chapter 9. And the problem is we have way too many believers in church that are bored with a God that we barely know. And the, how we got there again is we, pleasures are meant to be pointers. Let me say it in a bit of a different way. And when we take pleasures and we elevate them to the place of the ultimate, we create a God out of it, we begin to break our lives and abuse our lives. Pleasure in life is meant you to point you to the God who created pleasure. This is why David in the Psalms chapter 27 verse 4, this incredible statement that he makes, he says, this one thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. I want you to think about this for a second. Everybody in this room, you have a one thing. If you really get under the hood of your desires, the movement, the direction, the trajectory of your life, you and I have a one thing. And the question is, in view of this text, what is that one thing? For David, he said that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, right? He's like, God, God's that. Like, this is the one thing that I want in all of life. It's just to gaze upon the beauty of God. How many of you, that's the picture of God that you have when you come, it comes to your mind, right? He's like, I've, I've got such a compelling, transformative experience with the presence of God. I am wrecked and ruined for everything else in life. Have you ever had a moment in God's presence where you're just like, I get it. I don't want to leave. This is the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. Anybody show of hands you've ever experienced that where you just realized in a moment, like everything that I'm going after in life, it's all just a counterfeit. And this is what I was truly made for. God loves me, he's for me, I'm under his smile. Everything changes when you experience that reality in the gospel. I remember when I first began to get this, uh, I was uh, 19 years old and uh, I literally in a period of days went from sketchy back alley, uh, downtown Bellingham drug deals. And this is all decriminalized now, so I can, I can say this. Uh, and and I, I went to, I just want to read my Bible for eight hours a day. And that's what me and my friends did. We went from getting high to actually reading the scriptures because we had encountered something in Jesus that was incredibly transformative. Really soon after that, and got, I got involved in uh, youth ministry and uh, Pastor Steve Mason was our previous pastor here at New Song, founding pastor of Christ the King, incredible man. And uh, he was like, hey, I want you to uh, take our youth group. And I was like, you're crazy. And you put something weird in your coffee today. And he was like, yeah, I did, but you need to say yes. And so I was like, shoot, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. So I said, yes. And I started like working with these young kids. We had like our middle school, high school youth group at the time. It was called the Jesus Barn because we met in our worship pastor's barn in his backyard and it didn't have heating and it was miserable 
miserable in the winter that I was just so passionate about God. We talked to these 10 kids about Jesus and I used to tell them, right? Like, hey, I used to get high, but there ain't no high like the most high, right? And what they did, what they, okay, don't get excited about that because they ended up posting that on Facebook and I got in trouble with their parents. So I don't say that anymore. But the point is this, the point is this. I realized, and I still hold true to this, everything that I was looking for everywhere else I was only ever gonna find in Jesus. Everything was a counterfeit pleasure and beauty. In fact, C.S. Lewis, he talks about this in one of the greatest sermons that's ever been preached called The Weight of Glory. And he says, look, here's the problem of the human condition. It's not that our desires are too strong. It's that they're too weak. It's not that your desires are too strong. The real problem is that they're too weak, right? Which is kind of like, wow, that doesn't make any sense because I thought it was the reason why there's sin and addiction in my life is because my desires are too strong. And C.S. Lewis, he flips that. He's like, no, 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 you, your tolerance for temptation and for walking away from God for lesser counterfeit pleasures, it, the bar is way too low. We actually give into these things way too quickly. In other words, we're sellouts. That's what he's saying. You're, you're a sellout, I'm a sellout. We continue to live in a way that says, I I've got the ultimate beauty in the presence of God and I'm gonna trash that for a counterfeit pleasure and put that in the place of ultimate. Can I tell you this? For those of you that answered that question of what's the one thing in your life and you didn't put Jesus in that category, bad God, whatever it was. Jesus, every other God that you worship in life will demand that you have to die to get it. Christianity posits the only God who died to get you. It's not that your desires are too strong. It's that they're too weak. I'll give you an example from my life here recently. The other day, I was leaving here to go home and uh, there's a gas station up the road. I think it's a Chevron. I stopped in, I'm filling up my car with gas and I go inside because I got some time and uh, I'm walking around and I see this bag of Tim C. salt and vinegar chips. It's a family size bag. And immediately the thing is, it starts to talk to me. You guys know this voice. How many of you have experienced that voice? It's like, it just starts talking to you. It's like, hey, What's up, Taylor? How you starts giving me the eyes, you know? And I'm like, nope, not gonna do it. And then I just kind of keep, I keep walking around and man, that sounds so good. So I pick it up, I buy it. I walk out uh, to my car, rack up the pump, put the bag of uh, sea salt vinegar Tim's chips in the passenger seat. And it's a family size bag, right? And the thing begins to talk to me some more. And what's it saying, guys? Hey, just crack me open. Just open me. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. Because why? If I do that, what am I gonna do, everybody? I'm gonna, I'm gonna down the whole bag really quick. And I'm gonna regret it in a period of minutes. That is a big bag of chips. I got a 20 minute commute. I'm not down for that, but it's speaking to me. All seductive, like, you know, you want me, you know, you want to open me. And so here's what I do. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'll open the bag. So I take the bag, I pop it open. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going to smell it. I'm just going to smell it. This is what I'm going to do. So I take a whip. Oh, it's, you smell it right now, can't you? Like you, I know you can. And I'm like, no, that's it. I'm not gonna have any of you. I'm gonna wait till I get home because if I take a bag, that bite, the whole bag is done. I put it back in the passenger seat of the car. What does the bag do? It keeps talking to me just a little bit. Just have a couple. You guys know this voice, right? I'm not crazy. Okay, like just take a handful. And so what do I do? I'll just have a few. I reach into the bag, take a few. Oh, those are so good. And then I'm listening to my podcast and I don't realize that I just kept going. I get home, the entire bag is down and I regretted it later. That is what I'm talking about, guys. It's not that your desires are too strong. It's ultimately that they're too weak, that we give in way too quickly. And here David is saying, no, no, no look, it's, look at this. It's this one thing that I desire. And he's saying it's to gaze upon the beauty of God. You know, David, this wasn't like this one. He wasn't paid to do this. This wasn't like Logan Paul, drink prime. And he knows that prime sucks, right? It's just disgusting. He hates it. Y'all hate it. It's not good. This wasn't David like, this is bad for the brand if I don't say one thing I desire is the beauty of the Lord. No, he's like, this is, I had a true authentic transformative experience and I am ruined for every lesser pleasure in life. How many of you just shout me down if that's your testimony in church today? All right, that's, that's what many have experienced. And if not, the reality is, let me tell you why, it's because you're not gazing. It's because you're not actually encountering Jesus. And the reality is, if we get under the hood of that, it very well could be because you have actually a stronghold in your life. We'll get there in just a moment. But let me tell you something that might shock you. Core to uh, the way of life that is Christianity, a big theology word in the New Testament is this idea of sanctification. Everybody say sanctification. 
Okay, there's your big theology word for the day. Basically, it's the process. It's referring to the process of becoming like Christ. If you are a Christian, your destiny in God is to be conformed to the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means progressively, as a believer in Jesus, Paul says, this is the will of God for you. In 1 Thessalonians, it's your sanctification that by the power of the Holy Spirit, day by day, you are being conformed more into the image and after the likeness of Jesus, which means that this is the work that God comes to do in your life. He comes to take the character of Jesus and make it your character. He comes to take the thoughts of Jesus and makes them your thoughts so that when the world around you looks at you, it's like they're coming into an encounter with Jesus as he shines and moves through you. Does that make sense? That's the destiny of your life. This is the idea of sanctification. But let me tell you what we've gotten weird in the church. We've made sanctification something that you do. I'm gonna trip over a religious spirit and offend somebody here. We've made it. I gotta try hard. I gotta white knuckle. I gotta, I gotta fight sin with all I got. And we have inevitably, which there is a place for that, but we have inevitably removed ourselves, taken that too far. And we have adopted a bad view of sin that says, you know what? I can beat sin if I try hard enough. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Anybody with me? Right? Anybody grow up in that system where it's like you, you were just taught, well, I got to try really hard. And if I try really hard, I can beat sin and I can become like Jesus. How many of you are humble enough to church and say, yeah, that didn't work. Right? That just, it doesn't work. Sin is more powerful. Jesus didn't die, y'all, on the cross because we were pretty good and pretty close to figuring it out. He died because the grip of sin sentenced you to death and hell. You were a slave. You couldn't get yourself out. And now by the blood of Jesus, you can be broken out of that slavery, and it is only by his power that you can experience that freedom. And this is where many of us are. We're saying, you know, I, this is how I become like Jesus. I got to try, I got to try, I got to try. I got to try really hard, but this is completely antithetical to the teachings of the scripture. Let me show you uh, what I'm talking about here, because what I'm trying to say is this, that you become like Jesus. You want to know how? You gaze. Mark chapter 9. You, you think Peter, James, and John came off that mountain the same, everybody? forever changed because they saw the glory of God. They were forever changed. I'll show you this in the scriptures because some of you are like, what is this guy saying right now? Second Corinthians chapter three, verse 18. The reason why you're saying that because you got a religious demon and this sermon is for you. All right, this is divine, baby. You're here for a purpose. This is what Paul says. And we all, speaking of the church, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the spirit. Paul's saying this is how the believer is sanctified. He doesn't say we all with unveiled face and are trying really hard are becoming more like Jesus. He says, beholding. You want to know how you become like Jesus? You behold him. You become by beholding. Do you see that in the text? We're beholding the glory of God, that the glory of God is weighty. There is presence. It leaves an impression. It is so powerful what comes off of Jesus that it literally changes you. In fact, the scriptures say, the spirit reminds me, Paul writes about the second coming of Jesus and how we're going to see him and immediately we're going to become like him. Right? Like that's, that's your destiny. And right now, the Holy Spirit, one degree at a time, as we behold Jesus, makes us more like Jesus. Do you see that? Notice how Paul says this works out. One degree of glory at a time. How many of you type A, super driven people are just super frustrated with that like I am? Right? You want the 10 degrees, the 50 degrees, the 100 degrees at a time. And so often the path of sanctification and discipleship, it's one issue at a time. It's it's one step at a time. It's one addiction at a time. It's one degree of glory at a time. This is how God brings transformation. But what does he say? You become by beholding. This comes from the Lord who is the spirit. That's where it comes from. That's where the transformation comes from. The reason why many of you are not growing in your relationship with Jesus, you're not growing as a Christian, you're frustrated this isn't working, let me tell you exactly why. You are not growing because you are not gazing. You might not be growing as a believer ultimately because you are not actually gazing. You're not being sanctified because you're not staring at Jesus. You're not becoming like Jesus because you're not actually beholding Jesus. And this is why we do the prayer room here at New Song, everybody. I have experienced more transformation 
transformation in my life in a one hour prayer meeting with worship on this stage going down and my Bible open than a hundred hours of me trying really hard to straighten my soul out. One moment in God's presence is enough to completely alter an entire life. I wanna show you this in the text in Mark chapter nine. In verse two, this is really amazing. And I wanna layer this over a couple different passages. It says in the text that Jesus was transformed Figured. That word in the Greek is metamorpho. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. Uh, you can think caterpillar, butterfly, that type of transformation. Jesus becomes otherworldly here in this text. If we go back to 2 Corinthians 3.18, where Paul says, be transformed, same word. I'll give you one more, Romans chapter 12, verse two. This is amazing. I'll tie this all together for you in a second. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be, help me, transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That word transformed, guess what that is? Same in the Greek, same thing. So, so here's, here's the principle. Just as Jesus became otherworldly in appearance, what God is saying through Romans 12, verse two, through 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, is that your mind should do that same thing. That just as Jesus became otherworldly in physical appearance, the inner furnishings of your life as the Spirit transforms you begins to reflect the kingdom of the heavenlies and you see, you act, you live, you do, you value completely different than everybody else. That is the work of the Spirit in your life. It's a process of transformation. Paul says that your mind has to be renewed. This is like, you know, when you get an iPhone, because many of us, you're on like your 10th iPhone, 12th iPhone, and you get the new one, right? And there's that glorious moment where you're opening the box and then it breaks the vacuum seal and you've got that sound and the angel choirs are going in the background. And then you take that black screen of death that's going to destroy your life out of the box and it's brand new. And you know, it's going to destroy your relationships and take all your money, but you're so excited to see it. All right. This is the, this is the kingdom right side up version of that, where God is like, no, no, no. I, I, I want to renew your mind. I want to make it new. I want to bring transformation to you. And we need this because why? Your mind has been messed up by sin, by addictions, by by bad ideas, by traumas, by toxic thought patterns. And Jesus is saying, we gotta, we gotta shift all of that. So let me do a bit of a thought experiment here for you. Uh, and and let, me, let me just say this. I want you to ans answer this question, okay? Is your mind, because we're gonna start getting into strongholds now, would you describe your mind as more a hell or a haven? How would you describe living in your head? Is it more of a hell or is it more of a haven? Is it a place that you're scared of or a place of respite, refuge, and rest? How would you describe the state of your mind? Is it a hell or is it a haven? And of course, what's amazing about this, I was thinking about this all week, modern neuroscience is finally catching up with the Bible. Go figure, right? Like, how many of you love that? It's like, yeah, you know, you guys are talking about this whole neuroplasticity, neuroscience stuff, like Bible's been way ahead of you for 2,000 years. Thanks for catching up. You know, like, you know it's like it, it, they, they cheated, like on a high school test, it's like looking over and like, what'd you put? That's what they did with the Bible. Like this is, this is literally uh, the scriptures that I just laid out for you. And this idea of neuroplasticity is this. We now know that you don't have to stay stuck being as messed up as you are. You can change your brain, right? And this is what Paul is saying. This is what God wants to do, that the battlefield for the believer is in between your ears. You wanna know the greatest enemy in your life, friend? It's not anything that's coming against you. So often the greatest fight to be had in the life of the believer is the eight pound rock that's in between your ears. Jesus is saying, I've come to set you free from the powers of Satan, sin, death, and hell, but also from your own mind. And it's gotta be renewed. This is what Jesus is coming to do in your life and in mine. I mean, do you know how, you know how powerful your mind is? It dictates the entirety of your life. Here's how this works. Your thoughts, all right, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is why your mind is, and the renewal of it is so important. Your thoughts lead to your actions. Your actions then become your habits. Your habits then dictate your destiny and what you're gonna do in life. Your destiny then ultimately impacts your legacy and generations down the line to come. And where does it start? Your thought, your 
your thoughts? What is, what's happening in your mind? Is it more of a hell or is it a haven? I mean, think about how powerful your mind is. I had a dream the other night, right? I just, it's wild. The stuff that, we, like, dreams are just insane. I remember I was in this dream and I'm looking at, I'm in this, like, beautiful forest and I'm looking at the trees and I can see all the details of the leaves. I can see the sunshine, the rays of sunshine, like, coming through the branches and I'm with my beautiful wife and we're just, like, kid-free, like, ha, 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 you know, like, just enjoying ourselves and we're moving through the forest. We get through the forest and it breaks out into this beautiful blue ocean on this sandy beach with blue skies and sun hits us and it's just like, wow. I wake up from the dream and you know what I did? I was like, this is prophetic. God is definitely speaking to me now, right? And we're, we're going on a trip. We're gonna go find some sunshine. But that, I mean, that, my brain made that up right? That's crazy. This is the power of the human mind. And what God is saying to many of us is just as Jesus was transfigured, uh, you think of Jesus in Mark chapter 9 with radiating, shining. If you walked into Buffalo Wild Wings after church like that, would somebody take notice? Okay, so now the scriptures are saying that's your mind as it gets renewed in Christ. Do people see how you handle situations and, wow, I'm preaching now, stresses and difficulty in life and how you wade through the storms of it all and your relationship with money and your spouse and your kids? Do people look at you as a person and say, man, there's something different about you, all right? There's just, there's something that's different about, yeah, my mind's been renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, welcome to church. Like that's, that is the process of what God comes to do in your life. I've heard it said once, uh, you know, like, because people, you get these, somebody gets on fire for God, they're super excited, they're just going really hard after Jesus, and then religious people come around, try to pour some water on that fire, and they say stuff like this, well, you are too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that before? Maybe you've been accused of that. This is literally me in my early 20s. You are, your head's so in the clouds, Taylor, you're so excited, and you're just super passionate. You're no good to anybody else. What are you doing? You're just living in the prayer room, and what are you, you're, you're Disaster, right? You're too heavenly minded. You're no earthly. You want to know what the real problem in the church is? It's not that we got too many believers that are too heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. It's because we got too many believers in the church of the West that are too earthly minded that they're no good to heaven. The mind hasn't been renewed. I mean, think about it. You a million years from now are going to be with God in eternity. And you showed up to church today and you were like this parking lot, man, these people drive me insane can't get a freaking spot, you know? I mean, it, it, you're going to live forever. You chill out, you know, like you're fine. I mean, think about it. This is something we get stressed and anxious about. This is what God comes to do. He comes to transform how you view yourself and the world and God and those around you. So how is the mind renewed? Let's take it a step deeper, okay? Can we do that? The answer is very simple. Do not go to sleep on me. The answer is you give yourself to the study of the scriptures. And some of you, let me just say this. Your problem is this, and you're, you're tempted to just go to sleep on me right now for the rest of the message because yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. I gotta read the Bible, okay? Whole message, read the Bible, get it. Let's get the worst team back up here and go. All right, let me just say this. You're religious, number one. Number two, just because you know the Bible doesn't mean you read the Bible and that the Bible is transforming your life. All right, I'm just telling you what it is, right? Just because you know the Bible, you know, it doesn't mean that you read the Bible and it doesn't mean that the Bible is actually a place of deep intimacy and relationship with the Spirit of God as he unpacks the scriptures for you in your life. Now, how the mind is renewed is through the scriptures. This is Paul gets this idea in Ephesians chapter six, verse 17, where many of you are gonna be familiar with the passage. He goes through like, put, you know, this idea of put on the full armor of Christ. And he's talking about the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. And I remember I was in like this fifth grade play where I was a Roman soldier and I was the biggest, baddest Roman soldier in the, in the crew. I'm just kidding, because uh, I was a tiny kid. And, uh, and I had, and I remember we were going through like the helmet of salvation. It's not a literal helmet. Paul's not dumb. He's not like, yeah, go actually get armor and walk around with that downtown Bellingham. That's you get, how you get it carted off uh, and you go away for a little bit. But, you know, like he, he says, you put on the helmet of salvation. What, what, is, what, what is the head? It's the image of the mind. It says, helmet of salvation, what does that mean? Think saved. Do you think saved? Come on. 
Do you think, so what is this? You, you might be like, well, what does that, what does that look like? Let me, let me just say this, guys, again, the battlefield for, and there's so much of that symbolism and metaphor uh, in the scriptures, Ephesians 6, 2 Corinthians, all over the place. We're gonna look at another, pa another passage where Paul and the writers of the New Testament are equating what happens in your mind as a war zone. It's the battlefield for the Christian life. It's gonna dictate your trajectory and the impact that you have in this life and on those around you. And this is a place where primarily Satan and demons are going to be occupied in the life of a believer. It's with your mind trying to get access here, trying to get you to take off thinking saved and put on, God rejects me. God doesn't love me. Look at what I've done. Come on, are you with me right now? Right? Like he's gonna walk out. I'm just waiting to screw up one more time and then he's gonna hit me with the divine lightning bolt of justice and, you know, kick me out of his family and then I'm done because that's what my dad did when I was little. He told me that he didn't want me and now God's gonna do that, right? That's nonsense. You're not thinking saved. This is where God wants access in your life. In addition, look at the life of Jesus. From his own cross, the one man who has ever had a right to question if God loved him was Jesus as the will of God put him on a cross to die for sin that was never his own. You wanna know what his last words were on the cross? Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit, which means this, friend, in the hands of the father who is so good, even your worst day can turn out for good. He had resurrection right around the corner. And where did he start? Father, right? Because, and let me just tell you something. Uh, this is a secret to life. For those of you who are going through something difficult right now, that is a wide open door where you are vulnerable, where the enemy who does not play fair, who was at war against your soul, who wants to destroy you, is gonna come. And he's gonna say the same thing that he said to Eve in the garden. He's gonna say the same thing that he said to Jesus in the wilderness. What is it? Are you really God's son? Is he really for you? Does he really love you? Because if he did, how come you're going through this? And what does Jesus say on the cross? My father, he kept his relationship with God intact, even in the midst of his own suffering. Is this helping anybody? He kept it in view. That's your inheritance in Christ. This is what it means to have the mind of Christ, Paul talks about, that we have been given the mind of Christ, and this is where the mind is renewed. As we take the lie, we throw it in the garbage can, we take the truth of the scripture, and we allow that to win out in our lives. Uh, so then how do we do that? Okay, so let's take this a layer deep. Can we take this a little bit deeper? Okay, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses three through five. Paul says this, for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war. Again, there's that warfare type theme right here, according to the flesh. For the powers, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. If your Bible is open, circle that word. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Paul says, you, here's what you need to do, right? You need to actually begin taking every thought captive. And the reason why, if you answered the question, what is your mind more, a hell or a haven? If you said hell, the reason why is because here's, here's what your brain does. Your brain thinks something and therefore thinks that it's true. It's an incredible organ that God put in your body that's been messed up and jacked up by sin. And what we tend to do as human beings is we think, well, because I have this thought, therefore it must be true. But <laughs> I would say 80% of the time, and that's not the case. And everybody who was married said, amen. <laughs> All right. Okay. Tell me I'm wrong. This is, this is, this is where Paul is saying what you got to do is you have to actually begin taking your thoughts captive, which means that you have to ha be aware of them and you have to arrest them. This is what he's saying. He's using military language. He's saying, you get the thought, what you got to do is you walk up to it, you put it in handcuffs, you take it over to King Jesus and you say, Hey, did this come from you? And then if he says yes, you lock it down, you let it out, you let it free, and you let it transform your life. And if not, you take that stupid thought, you put it in a cardboard box, put some tape on it, write return to sender, and pfft, kick it out. That's what you, I'm telling you, this is the case for many people in the church where you just, you don't actually do that. And the reason why is because you don't have the tools and you don't know what God wants to do and the power that you can actually have over your mind. And you've held on to lies that have then become strongholds in your soul that are keeping you back. Which means, and, and Paul says in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 10, again, what does he say? He says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That means the thoughts in your mind, are they obeying Jesus? 
which means this, if it's not in his mouth about you, why would it ever be in your mouth about you? If it's not in Jesus's mind about you, why would it ever be in your mind about you? Can I make somebody mad? If it's not in Jesus's mouth about somebody else, it should never be in your mouth about somebody else. Ooh, ow. If it's not in Jesus's mind about somebody else, it should never be in your mind about somebody else. I'll just leave that there for you to deal with, and we're going to move on here, right? That's, that's what it means. You got to take the thought captive to obey Jesus. Let me just say this, friend. Here's what you need to understand. The lie always leads to bondage and death. Jesus says you're going to know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. He says in John 14, I am the truth. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And some of you, your mind is a very unsafe place. And you don't know it, by the way, and this is what I'm trying to bring awareness to. Uh, it's like the story of the two fish swimming, right? And one fish looks to the other and he says, hey, how's the water today? And the other one looks at him, he's like, what's water? You know, and that's the case for many of us in the context of your mind. You actually, maybe you're just getting awareness to the fact that, wow, my mind is a hell, Right, right now, you're just like, it's not normal. Let me just say this, that is not normal. That is not God's intended uh, design for you in your mind, right? You've got bitterness, you've got resentment. You're just racked by resentment. You're racked with offense. You're mad at people. You're angry all the time. You're hurt, you're wounded. You're consistently critical. You're nitpicky. You love pointing out the sins and the faults of other people, not knowing that the scriptures are first and foremost, a mirror to our own dysfunction and sin before it ever becomes comes a pair of binoculars to look at somebody else's. And if you grew up in a religious system where that was the case, just always looking at and condemning other people instead of realizing like, wow, this is a sword that's got to pass through my own soul, right? And you've got, you're just grouchy. You're just grouchy. You're just grouchy all the time, like anxious about everything. Some of you were like, yeah, I married that guy. And I'm glad that you brought him to church today, right? Like this is, this is the reality of many of our minds. And this is evidence that your mind has not been discipled by Jesus today. How can you tell if your mind has been transformed? I think we can, uh, we can bring it all the way down to one word. The mind that has been transformed, that has been transfigured, that has been effectively discipled by the Spirit of God as you behold Jesus, one word, peace. Do you have a peace? The mind that is restless, where you can't shut off, some of you, I know this, and I'm just gonna speak prophetically here. You are tormented in the night. Demonic dreams. You're up, you're anxious, mind racing, heart pounding, gut churning. You don't have a peace. And I wanna just declare over you right now in the name of Jesus, this room is where that thing goes to die. Are y'all with me? I don't know what's going on right now. Are you with me? So this is, this is the thing. Is do, you, do you have a mind of peace? Jesus says in John chapter 14, my peace I leave with you, that the peace of Christ is what guards our mind and our heart. This is what's gonna fortify you from the difficulty and pain. Do you have a peace? Can you say that, yeah, I can, if you, if you here's how you can tell. If you can't take a nap, you might have a stronghold. All right, that's what I'm trying to say. If you can't just chill out and receive the peace of Jesus, this very well could lead to a stronghold in your life. And the idea is this, everybody, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. If you do not take your thoughts captive, your thoughts will take you captive. Let me say that one more time. If you do not do what Paul says in 2 Corinthians and take your thoughts captive, your thoughts will hold you captive. If you don't arrest them, they're gonna arrest you. If you don't disciple them with the truth of the scripture, they're going to disciple you with a lie that's gonna affect your view of God, yourself, and the world and affect how you live in it and keep you from peace. This is what the lie, this is what the stronghold wants to do. It wants to keep you from the peace of Jesus. That's what he wants to do in your life. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Because right? you're, you're, that's not going to happen if you don't know the scriptures. That's the whole point. And if you don't take your thoughts captive, ultimately it leads to strongholds. Strongholds in the mind are established. Let's define it for a second. Strongholds come from a lie which didn't come from Jesus. 
that are believed over a long period of time. That's how you get a stronghold. It's a lie that didn't come from Jesus that's believed and revisited over and over and over again that just becomes automatic. It's an area in your life that has not been surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus and where therefore you can experience even demonic torment and terrorization. In 2 Corinthians 10, this is the only time that word stronghold appears in the New Testament and it's referring to a military fortress. Scholars tell us that they think that what Paul was writing on is if you go to Corinth, you would see this fortress on top of a giant hill. And it was, a, it was like an impenetrable thing, this great, uh, this great military fortress that would be incredibly difficult to penetrate. And Paul's like, this is what lies that are believed over a long period of time become, and you have to tear them down brick by brick, right? It's, it's warfare imagery. This is what he is saying. Again, by the way, this is where neuroscience is finally catching up with the Bible. This is an idea, the idea of a neural pathway. And the principle of the neural pathway is this, that the more you travel a specific pattern of thought, the easier it is to find that specific pattern of thought next time. It's like a trail. It's like Chuckanut, right? You go to Chuckanut, for those of you that uh, have two screws loose in your head and you want to hike Chuckanut, you go there, the trail's pretty easy to find, right? And you stay on the trail. And the reason why it's easy to find is because it's been traveled by so many feet, See what I'm saying? That's a neural pathway. Whereas if you want to try to forge a new trail up to the top of Chuckanut, it's going to be uphill. It's going to be difficult and probably stupid. And you shouldn't do that. You should do that in your mind, but not there. That is the idea of a neural pathway. This happens in marriages all the time. For those, Raise your hand if you've been married for more than 20 years, by the way. Let me just show hands. Okay, because I'm talking to you guys. You know this is true. And I need you to shout me down for everybody that's younger and less less educated than you are in the ways of marriage, okay? So if you're married, what happens is, you ever notice how you fight about the same stuff all of the time? Okay, so like, you know, for example, like, hey, hey, babe, where do you wanna go for dinner tonight? I don't know, where do you wanna go for dinner? Well, I asked you, I asked you where you wanna go for dinner. Well, where do you wanna go? And then all of a sudden it becomes this thing and it's like, you never initiate, you don't care about me and blah, blah, blah. And then we get to like, it's your mother's fault. You know, it's like, where did that come from? I have no idea how we got there. Now here's the thing, cause it doesn't make sense that it never makes sense. But the problem is, is you get so good at fighting with your spouse, you know what they're gonna say to the thing that you're gonna say. And you know that when you say that, they also know how they're gonna respond and you know how you're and respond to that response. And so my wife and I are so good at this now, guys. You want to know what we do? If we get a conflict, we just look at each other for 2.5 seconds, don't say anything, <laughs> like project the whole argument out in our mind, kiss and make up and move on. It's a great hack. I promise you it will lead to a lot more flirting than fighting in your marriage. I highly recommend it. Married people, amen. All right, shout me down. You always, that's a neural pathway. It's, we always fight about the same thing. And marriages have these conflict zones where it's like, we're most likely to fight about this. And the reason why is because the more you fight about it, the more likely you are to fight about that thing. That is a neural pathway. You have a stronghold in the context of your marriage. Some of you in your marriages, you got a stronghold of bitterness. It's you bitter, you're cold, you're resentful. You do resentment and bitterness instead of forgiveness and mercy. You've got more of a hell in your marriage than a haven as God has intended it to be. That is a stronghold. Now let's analyze this a little bit. Can we go a step deeper? Okay, look at this. Behind every stronghold is a lie. Talked about that. Behind every lie is a fear and behind every fear is a, in an idol. This is gonna be really helpful uh, for somebody. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. So uh, from my life, actually, uh, in 2021, many of you know my family story. We lost our daughter in December of 2021, Hallie, and a devastating, epic loss, horrible, painful, excruciating, life ending. For those of you that have lost children, you know that that's the case, should never happen. That following year in 2022, we did not have one miscarriage or two miscarriages, but three. And I do think that we might've had a fourth, but we only have evidence for three. So we lost four babies in, the, in one calendar year. Epic loss, horrible loss, devastating loss. I then, I, I, I developed a stronghold in that season where basically what happened is I've got two older kids that are uh, now six and four whom I love so much and our daughter Willow who is just seven months old yesterday. She's our miracle baby and God has been so faithful to us. And let me just say this. If you are in a season of miscarriage, of stillbirth, of struggling to have a baby, hope in God. And this is a place where we've seen Jesus do incredible work there. You need to come up today and let's pray for you and believe God for a miracle in your life. But I developed a stronghold. 
I developed a lie. I really, I gave myself to the stronghold of, uh, of control, of anxiety, of fear. And so ultimately what happened is my sister-in-law, who I love so much, came and visited us uh, from Florida. She took my older two kids on an anti-date because she's amazing. And uh, I had a panic attack because my kids weren't with me. And I was expecting, I was playing out everything that was going to go wrong because my kids weren't with me. Parents, you know you do this, right? It's just like, and then, and then they start driving and I can't even imagine, okay? So they're, I'm just imagining, they're going to get in a car wreck. I'm going to get another bad call. I can't even handle that. I don't know if my faith can handle that. I don't know if I can handle that. I'm done if that happens. I just can't do this. I had a full-blown panic attack. I'm freaking out and I, I can't lose another kid. I'm expecting bad news every single day for a number of months and even I think probably about a year, I was in that place of waiting for the sky to fall. You ever been there? Where you just, you're just waiting for everything to break around you? That's where I was. I was expecting bad news to happen. Can I tell you that's a stronghold? And so what do you gotta do? Because you, you, can, you can identify it, but you can't just tear it down because if you tear down the stronghold and you don't replace it with something, you're gonna end up worse than you were. And so here's what you have to do. And this is where a relationship with the Holy Spirit is so critical because this is gonna be specific to, I'm gonna lead you guys through an exercise here in a second. And this is what you're gonna have to do. I had to ask the Holy Spirit, what am I believing that's a lie? And what are you gonna replace it with from the truth of your word? And so I sat with God for a second. I'm in this place of fear and panic and doubt and anxiety. And I had the Holy Spirit speak to me this passage uh, in the Psalms where David says uh, that the, the righteous man does not fear the day of bad news. He's not afraid of getting bad news. He's not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. And immediately anxiety broke off of my life. Immediately fear broke off of my life. But I had to be willing to say, this is a lie. I'm, I'm gonna take it captive. I'm gonna take it to Jesus. I'm gonna return to sender. And I'm gonna live into the truth of the scripture. Because you know what fear is? The fear of control. Ultimately, it's a failure to trust in the sovereignty of God. And this is what God was speaking to me. This is a, this, so let's go through the exercise here, okay? Let's get the stronghold pathway up again. What was the stronghold? Stronghold, lie, fear, idol. What was my stronghold? Anxiety and control. What was the lie? Everything depends on my planning and my control and my ability to protect my children by me being there. What was the fear? If I don't control things, I'm gonna get a bad call. Something horrible is gonna happen. What was the idol? Self-reliance. How many, how many of you know that you just can't control anything in life, right? Have you learned that yet? You can't control anything. 2020 was a primer on that. You could wake up tomorrow, the whole world's freaking shut down. You cannot control anything in life. And ultimately, a failure to do so is a failure to trust in God's sovereignty in your life. And some of you, let me give you an exa another example. You've got incredible deep-seated fear of rejection. You know, you never think that you're good enough. You never think that you measure up for other people. And you've it's actually made it so you can't have healthy relationships because you're so afraid of being rejected by other people, you won't open up to them. That lie wasn't taken captive. Maybe your parents didn't want you, right? They, they, you had a dad that said, you know, like, I don't want you. I, you're a mistake. You shouldn't be here. Your middle school crush rejected you. You put the little note in their locker and then they didn't return it back and you got a root of rejection there that continued to grow and grow and grow because you never discipled it. You never brought it to the truth of the scriptures. And you continued to find that in every relationship and it became a stronghold in your life. And ultimately what it does is it affects your relationship with God because if I've been rejected by everybody else, well, God's gonna reject me. So I might as well not just take this whole Jesus thing too seriously. What more does he have to do, man, to prove to you that he's never gonna reject you? Do you know how arrogant that is? You know, I, you know how prideful that is to think that that's true? What more does he have to do? He hopped up on a cross, bled, suffered, and died, was crucified to prove to you that there is nothing that can separate you now from his love. And here's how the stronghold and the lie works. It's clever, but it's not correct. It's true, but it's not the capital T truth. And oftentimes this is where the enemy has a heyday in your life is because he'll take these seeds of truth. Well, yeah, your dad did say that. Well, yeah, this did happen when you were a kid. Well, yeah, that did happen in high school. Yeah, that did happen in college. Well, that did happen in your 20s. So it's clever. There's a seed of truth to it, but ultimately it becomes something that defines reality for you and was never actually brought to Jesus so he could tear it down. Is this helpful for anybody? All right. Here's the principle. Worship team, go ahead and come on up here. We're gonna wrap it down here in just a second. Here's the principle, y'all. The place of agreement is the place of power. 
and you got a choice. Are you gonna be somebody that agrees with the lie or are you gonna be somebody that agrees with the truth? This is your decision to make. And the lie always leads to bondage and Jesus always leads us into truth. I wanna uh, actually stare, share with you a study on this because uh, this is incredible. There was a, a research group called the Bible Research uh, Project or group, and they surveyed 400,000 people. This is incredible to analyze basically the effect of Bible reading on people. And what they did was they were like, okay, so let's take these 400,000 people. Let's figure out the, why a bunch of pe people don't actually read the Bible. And if they do read the Bible, does something actually happen? Is all the scripture that I laid out for you, does, does it actually lead to transformation in life? So what they did is they found a bunch of people that read their Bible one time or less per week, two times or less per week, three times less per week, or four times a week. And what they saw was for the person who reads the scriptures one time a week, minimal to no change in their life or lifestyle, nothing happened. Two times a week, minimal, nothing, just pretty much like everybody else that never reads the Bible. Three times a week, pretty much nothing, very minimal transformation change, if anything. But when they got to the people who read their Bible, the majority of the days per week, four days, they called this the power of of for effect. And they said, look at this, look at this. This is, this is where they saw incredible transformation in people's lives, All right? This is what they saw. People that read the scripture four days a week, the majority of days of the week, they're coming in contact with God's word. 57% decrease in drunkenness. 68% decrease in sexual immorality, 61% decrease in pornography consumption, 30% decrease in feelings of loneliness, 407% increase in memorizing scripture, 231% increase in discipling others, 228% increase in sharing their faith, right? So what's the point? The person who engages the Bible consistently looks radically different than everybody else. If you wanna be a healthy person, do what God says says in Mark chapter nine, this is my beloved son, listen to him. You are less likely to break your family through porn and adultery. You are less likely to break yourself through alcoholism, loneliness, intrusive thinking, destructive thoughts. And you are more likely to have a life of incredible impact as you study the scripture. Can I get a shout from somebody today? Because this is God's word and it is powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. Would you stand with me? I wanna go after some of these here in just a moment as we take communion. What are you gonna do? Friend, I wanna to submit to you a very simple way of going about this. This week, what I want you to do, one Psalm per day and one chapter in the Gospel of John. Today, you read Psalm chapter one and John chapter one. Tomorrow, Psalm chapter two, John chapter two. The next day, Psalm three, John three, on and on and on and on you go. This is how you are going to see radical transformation happen in the context of your life. As we approach the communion table this morning, I wanna ask you a question. And I'm gonna actually give you a tool to actually go through a process with the Holy Spirit here. Here's what you're gonna to say to the Spirit. Where's the lie that I am believing right now? Would you search me and help me find the lie? And then what you're gonna ask the Holy Spirit is what is the truth that's given to me in the gospel of Jesus through his broken body, his shed blood to replace that lie? Let me give you a few examples. You might have a habitual fear of rejection What's the answer? Jesus was rejected for you on the cross, so you will never be rejected by God. You got a fear of being lonely forever, never gonna find love. Jesus tore the curtain through his flesh so you could always experience God's presence in life. The lie is you're a worthless person. The truth of the gospel is that God sees so much value in you that he put up Jesus on the cross to purchase you. Right? The lie is I'm gonna struggle with addiction forever. The truth is Jesus' blood breaks the power of sin. And literally what I want you to do is this repentance. You gotta repent of the lie, take it captive, get rid of it, hear the truth of the spirit and let him tear down the stronghold today. Amen. Can I pray for you for that end? Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would come and do what only you could do. And you'd cause the lie to come up right now and that you would break it by the power of the blood of Jesus. And all God's people said,